discretion, used nine times in nine verses of the Bible, the act of sound and right judgment before God and men. When we begin to think for God in our lives, there's a great evil that can come into our lives. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. You are watching the Quick Study Television and Radio Program, and it's great to have you with us today as we go through the Bible in one year. That's what we do here at Quick Study. Now today, we land in the book called First Chronicles, and we are studying from chapter 21 to 22. We're gonna to focus today on chapter 21, in which David is actually persuaded to do something very evil. Yes, God's king, God's psalmist of Israel, is persuaded by Satan himself in his heart to do something evil. How can that be? How does Satan get inside of us sometimes? Well, we'll talk about that coming up in just a moment. Corey is also here with Bible History and Archaeology. Corey? This is a fun one. We're actually going to take a look at an archaeological slice of the city of Jerusalem. An archaeological slice? Yes. That's, that's, that's how they <laughs> do it. A few different layers. <laughs> they do that in archaeology. They take, you know, the, they take the layers down and divide mm -hmm. it up. And anyway, mm -hmm. that's coming up in just a moment. Stay there. Do you know? Yes. Do you know what two tribes Joab refused to count in the census that King David ordered? Now, this is, of course, uh, Second Chron excuse me, uh, First Chronicles 21, mm -hmm. when David did this thing. And Joab said, I'm not going to count them, not going to do it. Very interesting. That and more coming up. Stay there. In the meantime, let's begin now with Bible history with Corey Hembry. Now, the Bible says that the Philistines had five main cities. Now, interestingly, the records of Assyria also claim the exact same five cities as the prominent cities of the Philistines. Right now, you and I are going to track the history of the Philistines. The Philistines were a people group associated with the notorious Sea People of the 12th and 11th centuries BC. The Bible, Egyptian records, archaeological findings, and other ancient written records agree that the Philistines originally came from somewhere in the Aegean Sea. They were Greek, likely hailing from the island of Crete. Wall reliefs in Egypt from the reign of Pharaoh Ramses III depict a land and sea battle of these sea people versus the Egyptians. What is certain is that the battle did not end well for the sea people and that the Philistines ended up with a large presence in West Canaan along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. From here, they launched the attacks on Israel that appear in the books of Judges in 1st and 2nd Samuel. What is not certain is how. For many years, the dominant theory has stated that the Philistines settled in Canaan as captured vassals of the Pharaoh. This theory, while interesting, does not account for much of the archaeological evidence. The alternate theory sees the Philistines first taking over their territory in Canaan before launching into an assault of Egypt. Regardless, the Philistines were very much present in Canaan precisely when the Bible records them there. However, a Philistinian presence is also recorded in the city of Gerar during the days of Abraham and Isaac, many centuries before the migration of the Sea Peoples of Ramses III. Because of this, some scholars have claimed that Genesis is mistaken, that the mentions are anachronisms, references out of chronological order. 
other scholars believe that the references to Philistines in Genesis are a result of Philistinian trade and commerce into the Middle East. Indeed, archaeological support in the way of decorated buildings, pottery, and imported food from the time periods of Abraham and Isaac are found in Canaan. A Philistinian presence before the 12th century is both reasonable historically and attested to in the Bible. It's time to explore the wise guys of the Bible in ancient times, and they're, they're all around us. Now, wise guys, really wise guys, understand the power of Satan. This fallen angel is both ancient and brilliantly skilled in his evil bulwarks against God's people. So in 1 Chronicles 21, the unthinkable happens. I would feel much better, you know, if David were a pagan king or at least forged a history of hating God, but he doesn't. This is... God's psalmist of Israel. This is typically a wise guy. But the Bible is not going to tell us simply about feel-good things. The Word of God is the truth and is committed to tell the truth. And so it does here in 1 Chronicles. It tells us that Satan himself moved the heart of the good king David. This is troubling. Let's study on. First Chronicles 21, 1 through 14. Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and to the leaders of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, May the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are, but my Lord the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Then Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to David. All Israel had one million, one hundred thousand men who drew the sword, and Judah had 470,000 men who drew the sword. But he did not count Levi and Benjamin among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. And God was displeased with this thing, therefore he struck Israel. So David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing, but now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Then the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Choose for yourself either three years of famine or three months to be defeated by your foes with the sword of your enemies overtaking you, or else for three days the sword of the Lord, the plague in the land with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now consider what answer I should take back to him who sent me. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell. 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Now on the last Quick Study Television program, we were talking about David and the attitude that was beginning to emerge in the last part of his ministry. So the time is roughly 1020 to 1015 BC before Christ, which means that this was a rule that happened 3000 years ago. In the historical narrative, the Bible begins to bring up situations 
and the subtleties of these scenes tell us that David, David rather, is, is, uh, has seeds of arrogance that are growing in his life. Now that leads us to today, one of the greatest and most troubling and disturbing things that any believer in Jesus Christ, any person who calls himself a Christian, should be very concerned about. We are talking about Satan himself raising up in the heart of David, the good king of Israel, the anointed one of Israel. Satan somehow has access to his heart. And the same is true today, beloved. In our lives, we can allow Satan to have access to our heart, no, ma no matter how much in leadership, uh, how great we do in leadership, or how uh, profound we think we are in the church, or how many gifts of the Spirit we have. Satan can still, through the flesh attitudes in our heart, raise up in us. Now, let's take a look at 1 Chronicles chapter 21 verses 1 to 7 and learn how that should be avoided. The scripture says this as we begin. Now Satan stood up against Israel, look at this now, and moved David to number Israel. It was Satan who did this, not God. They'd take a census. That was not to be done except God commanded it through the priesthood. So David said to Joab and to the leaders of the people, go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. There's a lot of me's and I's there, isn't it? But then Joab, even David's brutal military commander, answered and said, David, may the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my Lord, the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then does the Lord require, that is small l, why does my Lord require this thing? Why should he be, cause sin and guilt in Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore, Joab departed and he went through all of the land of Israel and he came to Jerusalem. And then Joab gave the sum of the number of the people that David had asked for. All of Israel had 1,100,000 men who drew the sword and Judah had 470,000 men who drew the sword. But he did not count Levi, that is the priesthood, and Benjamin among them for the king's word was abominable to Joab, very interesting. And God was displeased that this thing had happened. Therefore, God struck Israel. Beloved, here's our first study wise point. Evil can overcome us, even when we're believers in Jesus Christ, when we begin to think that we can think for God in our lives. Now, that's very easy to happen, isn't it? Isn't it easy for us as we drive down the road uh, in our cars? Uh, we like to believe we're the captain of our own soul. And, and uh, we, we begin to t take God's word and look at it as advisement rather than commandment. And when that happens, uh, then we become in great danger. And evil overcomes us and begins to control our lives. That's what happened with David. The pride in his life caused him to listen to the lust of his heart more than the word of God. And when that happened, well, here's what happened. So David said to God, I have sinned greatly. He was convicted because I have done this thing. But now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. David seems to have a great deal of experience in repentance, doesn't he? Then the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer or prophet, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things to choose, one of them for yourself, that I may do it to you. Interesting. David repents, but there's still consequences. Now, God is teaching. This is called the discipline of the Holy Spirit. There's not a lot of teaching on the discipline of the Holy Spirit in today's world, especially in the church. But here it is. Evil can overcome us when we do not understand or feel the consequences of our sin. Therefore, David was punished by God because God wanted him to feel the consequences of his sin. That is called the discipline of the Holy Spirit. We're running out of time, so let's go on to verse 11. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, choose for yourself either three years of famine or three months defeated by your foes with the sword of your enemies overtaking you, or else three days of the sword of the Lord, the plague in the land which the angel of the Lord is destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now consider what answer that I should take back to him who sent me. Well, David was a wise guy. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel, 
70,000 men of Israel fell. Beloved, the full consequences of our personal evil will be limited by God's mercy with real and right repentance. Now you might say, well, Rod, that doesn't feel like God's mercy when 70,000 men of Israel, let me remind you of two things. God is just and punishment and destruction will not come to those who do not deserve it. Remember here that the atmosphere of pride was in the land. That's what motivated David to do this in the first place. So I would suggest that God was also dealing with the culture of Israel. But here, oftentimes, beloved, God allows us to experience the consequences of our sin to teach us, to make us teachable so that we can be corrected. For God loves those he corrects, and he corrects those whom he loves. So, beloved, today may we fall upon the hand of God and not resist him when he disciplines us. A hard lesson for all of us. By reading through the books of First and Second Chronicles, you will get a flavor, a taste of how much history happened in the city of Jerusalem. Right now, you and I are going to explore a slice of this city. One of the most famous sites in Israel today is the Western Wall, an uncovered section of Herod the Great's renovation projects to the Temple Mount. Just west of the Western Wall, archaeologists have made some headway in reconstructing the history of that part of the city. The site was not a part of the city of David and actually lay outside of Jerusalem's walls, likely until the days of King Hezekiah, who expanded the walls in preparation for Sennacherib's Assyrian invasions. During the days of David and Solomon, the site was used to quarry stones for Jerusalem's building projects. Only later, presumably during the days of Hezekiah, were buildings built over top of these quarries, using the remaining rock ledges as foundations for their walls and filling in the holes of missing stone with packed dirt and rocks. One of these buildings has been tentatively identified as the destroyed remains of an Israeli-style four-room house. This house and surrounding buildings were likely destroyed by the Babylonian invasion that ruined the city in 586 BC. The most intriguing finds were inside the rubble of the house. The lack of everyday living items seems to indicate that the occupants evacuated with the knowledge of the coming invasion. However, there have been several very tiny personal seals discovered that widely vary in style. From a uniquely blended Assyrian Judahite black seal belonging to Hagav, to a scarab style limestone seal preserving the name of Netanyahu, son of Yaush, and a perplexing pink limestone seal with a winged serpent engraving. These seals represent at least four to five individuals, and the Egyptian Assyrian influences in the seals are indicative of the alliances made to try and overcome the growing beast of Babylon. From quarries to expansions, invasions, destructions, and alliances, the ongoing exploration of Jerusalem continues to stand beside the Bible. The Bible is full of people who gained insight and instruction from God through dreams and visions. Does that still happen today? A pagan king Abimelech was warned in a dream not to touch Abraham's wife. A brutal Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar was given a vision of God and the future of planet Earth. Jacob was shown a stairway to heaven. What does all this mean? Join Rod, Janice, and Corey in a special one-hour DVD on biblical dreams and visions. We also ask the question, does it still happen today? And if so, what would you expect the God of the Bible to say in a dream based on what we know about the Bible? This special Bible Investigators DVD training video also makes a great topic for small group Bible studies. For your DVD video copy of Dreams and Visions on Bible Investigators, send $25 or more to P.O. Box. 
Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can also order online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. It is time for Do You Know? Yes. You are watching Quick Study Television. I'm Rod Hembry along with Janice, and we are trying to figure out what's going on in 1 Chronicles 21. David did not do a good thing. So what is the Do You Know question? Corey and I are going to answer it. Based on the census that David ordered, commanded uh, his people to do, it says, Do You Know What Two Tribes That Joab Refused to Count in the Census That King David Ordered? Do You Know? There's uh, this discussion to still happening. to me, and I have no idea what he's saying. <laughs> yeah, that's so, what. Yeah, we were discussing in the break. We we're discussing uh, Manasseh. We were discussing Le the Levites, Levi. We were discussing Benjamin, and I think our final tally uh, was Levites and Benjamites. But yeah, okay, do you agree um, with that too, Dad? I concur. He's giving you the two thumbs up. The two from, thumbs up from over here. <laughs> okay, from so this we're going side. with Levi and Benjamin. And, Levi and, and Benjamin. That's you, what we're going you with. You would both be right. First Chronicles twenty-one verse six tells us, um, but he Joab did not count Levi and Benjamin among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. Now it could be that Joab didn't want to include these two tribes because he didn't want God's judgment to fall on the tribe of the priests or on the tribe in whose territory the tabernacle stood. Very, and that's a very interesting point. Mm -hmm. uh, even Joab, I mean, ruthless Joab, warring Joab, mm -hmm. knew and understood this is not going to end up good. Well, and he begged King David not to do this. And King May David May God was... add to you thousands more, but why, David, yeah. would you do this? Exactly. Yeah, very interesting. It, it, when, it, when things go to back in 20, mm -hmm. they defeated the Ammonites. And the, the crown of the Ammonites back in one chapter yeah. was weighed 75 pounds. And there was a ceremony, we talked about this on the last program, in which David had that, he stood there and he had a, the 75 pound gold crown with jewels put on his head mm -hmm. in great pomp and circumstance. Pride, mm -hmm. it's always the wrong way. Uh, and that's what precipitated this sin in uh, 21. Mm -hmm. Listen, we want to mention to you that we have, a, I've written a Bible guide every single month, 12,000 words, one page each day to help you understand what we're going through. It's a commentary focused on the wisdom we glean from each one of these chapter assignments. It's called the Quick Study Wise Guide. Now we send this automatically out to people who in fact are uh, people who write to us and will support the program. Now let me take you through this. Inside the guide for each day we have of course the top part which is the wise guy segment talked about it earlier in the program it's written down for you in the bible guide for every day so are the study wise points with all the scriptures in fact so is wise at work in your life and even wisdom for living so all of this is part of the bible guide that's sent to you along with the discovery letter each and every month as you support us monthly now i want to encourage you because uh, we are really appreciate your support and for people who've never written to us before and you've actually been watching the program but you've never been a part of it those mm -hmm. are nice pens aren't they okay, look at that we've got you. some pens for you nice. put it on the screen Very here's nice. what they Let's look like around. we're going to send this to every new partner who joins up in the this month of may and as you can a red or a blue or a or a what color is that it's like a yeah, it's kind of like brown. a purple brown pen. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll send it to you. When you write, become part of the quick study ministry by supporting. We'll send that with your brand new pocket guide that comes for the month. So we want to encourage you to do so. Some people say, well, Rod, what do you suggest? Well, I suggest you pray about what God would have you do. But here are some suggestions. Some might support at $10 per month. That helps us. Some might support us at $25. That helps us too. And $50. Whatever God speaks to your heart, I want to encourage you to pray about joining us because every time a new partner comes to quick study it's a vote saying mm -hmm. yes we believe that the bible should be taught and this program publicly reads the bible there's at least three minutes or more of actual reading of the bible janice does each day broadcasting around the world on over 600 stations we read the bible and so we want to encourage you here's the address 
If you'd like to support us in the United States, then we appreciate it. P.O. Box 150, Marysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. For quicker service, you can call us at the office there in Marysville, beautiful Marysville, 724-733-8336. And my two brothers there would be happy to talk to you, Kyle and or Chad or Tony, uh, my, my beautiful sister-in-law. Now, also, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2, if you're in Canada, and our number here at the studio is 519-940-8338. You can also reach us at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. We'll be looking for your letter today. Here is Call to Prayer. Today's modern culture has become a world of wonder. We wonder why the economy is troubled, why there is corruption in our leaders, why many of our churches are stumbling. But it's not biblical to wonder. In fact, it's biblical ignorance to wonder why. God clearly tells us in his words there are consequences to sin. God's wisdom is at work in us when we learn to stop wondering why evil has taken hold and begin to repent learn from our failures, and seek deliverance from our Lord. So with that we pray, Lord, teach me not to be obsessed with wondering why our world is struggling. We know why. Sin, forgive us, heal us, and help us to turn and seek and love you. It is also our call here at Quick Study to introduce you to the wisdom from the Proverbs. Today our Wise Up segment, our reading assignment is Proverbs 14, 23 to 24. Here is one line of that particular passage. In all labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. What does that mean? It means that people who are big talkers and squawkers really don't get much done. But the people who do what they say and say what they do, that's a different deal. Now, I want to encourage you today, if you've met someone or you call themselves a Christian, they don't say what they do or do what they say. They might be lazy in their faith. Consider that. But there are those who are not lazy in their faith, and Jesus Christ was anything but lazy. He went to the cross and did the work necessary to, to free you from the judgment of sin, which came upon the whole earth when mankind rejected God. And you inherited the results of that. I inherited the results of that. It's called the sin nature. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Come to Jesus today. Learn your real potential. Pray and say, Jesus, I need you today. Come into my heart. If you're serious, he will.